I'm Shreyas. Uh, this is Rollin up here, my colleague. And uh, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, how we've used Jupyter Hub and Jupyter Notebooks to get a handle on some of the, the cool science problems we've been solving at NERSC. Um, so to start, actually, I'd like to, this is really who we are. Um, so this is the view from our center at NERSC. Um, so we're right by, right on top of the hills in Berkeley, um, overlooking the San Francisco Bay. And who we are, we're, we're the um, Office of Science uh, Production, High Performance Computing and Data Facility. Um, and the of, uh, Office of Science is the largest funder of um, basic research in the Department of Energy and, and really the largest federal funder of um, science research in general. Um, and, and we have, we cover a whole bunch of different areas. So bioenergy, advanced computing, material science, high energy physics, nuclear science, fusion. Um, so we have projects from all of these different spaces that run at our supercomputing center. And where they run is this system called Cori. So this is our, um, so Cori is our big supercomputer and it's a combination of um, a, what we call a data partition and a compute partition. So it's got Intel, Haswell nodes that, that are focused more on our data users and it's got uh, an HPC partition that has more cores um, per node. Um, we've got a bunch of special features that we hope will en enhance um, data-driven computing. So things like uh, NVRAM burst buffer, which is basically a big flash memory file system um, that, that people can read and write data from very quickly. We've got our batch queues optimized to do um, a lot of real-time computing, a lot of shared computing. Um, we've got containerized HPC in, with, in the form of this thing called Shifter, which is basically bringing Docker to supercomputing. Um, so yeah, so we're, we're trying to do a lot of fun stuff in, in the supercomputing space, which tends to be, you know, in some ways, still very different from the cloud in that it's all big iron. You've got these big clusters with uh, very specialized hardware. Um, but, but we're seeing more and more, you know, as kind of people are doing exploratory work in data that we kind of need um, a slightly different paradigm for how to actually start thinking about uh, use of these supercomputers. All right, so. All right, so, so what is, um, so, so now taking a step back, right? So uh, w what is data science? And, and so this is this thing that we grabbed from Wikipedia, so it must be true. Um, but, but, uh, but the idea is that you've got this ground truth, the reality of, of what's going on in the world. You collect that data. You process the data and then maybe you clean it. And then you go into this exploratory data analysis phase. And, and that's really where something like Jupyter would come, in, come into the picture. But, and then you kind of circle through that loop a little bit. And eventually you communicate and visualize your results, make decisions based on those resu results, and then possibly create more data products which feed to the ground truth. Um, in practice, what that often means, though, is that you've got here, here's sort of the real world side of that, right? You've got some manageable chunk of data. You then copy it to your laptop or workstation. You write a bunch of code. You need to make sure everything is reproducible. There's plots, there's equations, there's iteration. So in, in the sort of old school wor world, you kind of had to have scripts for everything. You had lots of different tools and you had to somehow bring this all together. Um, now, uh, so Jupiter kind of changes the, the equation a little bit. And what that does is it kind of gives you this one, this sort of unified place where you can now run all these narratives. Um, you can encode your work. You can add code, add comments, iterate. I mean, you guys are all familiar with Jupiter, so I don't need to be preaching to the choir here, but you get the idea. Um, now, supercomputing is still kind of stuck in this sort of old school mode where, you know, there's scientific insight is often dependent on having iterative exploration. You look at a bunch of data, you, you analyze it, and then you come to some interesting idea. You want to test your hypothesis, and you want to do this in a very tight loop. Um, but high performance computing tends to be very much of a, you know, command line batch driven enterprise and, you know, we don't quite see terminals like those, but, but it's pretty close. You've got people, you know, 
logging in through their um, SSH um, terminals, uh, clients, and, and compiling their codes and doing a lot of things that, that are not what I would consider conducive to this um, iterative discovery loop. Um, so really the question is, you know, how does Jupyter bridge this gap? And really, and how does, how does Jupyter fit into the context of um, running at a supercomputing center? So the difference between sort of, sm you know, smaller scale data analysis versus something uh, at a supercomputing center is we've got these fairly deep questions that people want to ask. There's data being collected from fairly large instruments, so things like the Large Hadron Collider or big telescopes. Um, uh, big simulations that are running are actually generating data that needs to be analyzed. So you've got you know, massive, massive amounts of data that are coming into these supercomputers. Um, but then you want to be able to do some sort of insightful real-time analysis. You want to do exploratory an analysis. You want to be able to do, ma make some decisions based on you know, what data you care about, what data will, will basically continue to live on the system, what data gets thrown away. Um, so so it's, it's, it's all sort of stuff that needs to happen on board the supercomputer. You can't really farm that out. And, and here's kind of the, the big picture of what we're trying to do. Um, so you've got all of these resources sitting on our supercomputers, and users want to be able to submit jobs, monitor jobs, interact with those jobs. You've got our file systems that people want to be able to, to access. There's software modules underneath it. There's databases. So all of these things kind of need to come together. Um, Python has played a pretty important role in this space. So we've got um, most of our users, a very large number of our users, are actually using Python as the engine to kind of script everything together to bring all these um, different pieces of their scientific pipeline under one umbrella. Um, all right, so the motivation for now coming for, for all, of, all of this is, so we started seeing all of this, and then our users basically like, okay, this is cool, and they ended up start running their own notebook servers on the supercomputing login nodes, and basically just started using that um, without our knowledge, which is fine. But it started to make our security folks a little bit nervous because the idea of just sort of running something that's exposed to the public uh, on an open port was not great. Um, and pe we started getting questions about you know, different kinds of kernels, how do we manage those. So it, it was not an ideal situation. Um, but then JupyterHub came along and ended up solving a lot of these problems. So, Jupyter Hub is basically a centralized service to deploy these notebooks, so, and we can now do this in an authenticated manner. We can package up specific kernels so we can give users a standard environment, and then we can access all of these resources that I talked about, um, in the file systems, the batch system, the databases, the, the environment, all under you know, the, the, this, this common environment. Um, so, in case folks are, are not familiar with Jupyter Hub, it's basically this multi-user environment um, that allows people to create their own notebooks under a common framework. Um, so it manages things like user authentication, it manages the notebook spawning and deployment, and it manages things like web proxying. So you come into this single interface and it proxies things between that server and the back end. Um, so yeah, towards this end, so we so we, we kind of felt like okay, we need to set up this Jupyter Hub service. Um, so the first thing is, you know, we got to give the people what they want. So we give them their data. Um, so we started with uh, this this single node, um, what we call an edge service node, uh, to to deploy this. So this was basically a node that where where users came in to this Docker container that ran Jupyter Hub, and everything just kind of ran locally. So people. We're able to bring up uh, Jupyter Notebooks on this node. Um, we mounted the big file systems at our center onto this system, so people now had access to the file system. So it was not quite on board the supercomputer, but it shared a file system, so you could start to do a lot of interesting things with the data that you were generating from your simulations or preparing the data. Um, and this became popular very quickly. So we ended up with over 100 users in the manner of just, I think, a few months. And, and, and um, we were missing a few key components, but 
this was definitely a really good place to start. Um, what we didn't have, though, was access to the actual batch jobs that were running. We, and we didn't have access to the core file systems, things like the Luster file system or the burst buffer file system that you would want with your jobs. Um, we didn't have access to the same Python environment that the jobs were running in. So it was not quite ideal. Um, so this is kind of where we move, move towards this, the, the, this new architecture, which integrates our compute system with our file systems and allows us users to still log into NERSC, but now they have access to the big Cori supercomputer through Jupyter Notebooks. Um, so people, still lo people now log into the Jupyter Hub server. We use this thing called an SSH spawner, which lets you go off and spin up a notebook on a Cori node directly. And now it has access to not just the global file system, but the Cori specific file system as well. And we've got some hooks to be able to access the um, batch queue system in there. Um, so, so this was actually you know, a big plus forward, and then we're, we're seeing more and more projects basically just you know, once they start using this, it's really hard for them to go back. Um, so the, the pieces that we added to make all of this stuff happen, um, so we added a custom authenticator to Jupyter Hub, um, and that let people log in with their nurse credentials, their usernames and passwords, and got them a little token that could then be used by the other piece of it, which was the SSH spawner which would go off and which will uh, spin up notebooks on the other side um, using this token. And we added um, some additional sort of what we called slurm magics to be able to talk to our batch queue system. So a little bit about the GSI authenticator. It allows users to log in with their username and password. It goes off and gets an X509 certificate for that user. Um, and then uses that X509 certificate to talk to um, the, the Cori node. Um, this also means that Jupyter Hub can now run as a standalone service. Um, doesn't need root access to do anything, so you just get these certificates and log the user in directly. Um, the other piece that we wrote, this was actually inspired somewhat by uh, Andrea Zonka from San Diego. Um, so he had something called the remote spawner and then we expanded on that and modified it to do a little bit more. Um, so we wrote this thing called the SSH spawner, which uses, you can use SSH, you can use GSI SSH, you can use different kinds of um, tokens to basically log into the back end. Um, it basically starts up a notebook server process and then goes away. Um, and it'll just use the, the keys to communicate with things over an SSH connection as needed. Um, and it keep, does things like it keeps track of the remote process ID to pull and shut down notebooks. Um, and then we also added this piece called the Slurm Magics, which would let you talk to the batch system on the back end. So you can use this to submit jobs. So you craft your jobs as this batch script, which, yes, old school supercomputing. Um, and then you can query, you can query the queue. You can cancel your job. So you can interface with something like Slurm or PBS using this type of thing. Um, one of the other things that our users wanted was this ability to have custom kernels. So a lot of what we tend to see, so you know, we, we, it was really nice to be able to have these common environments and everyone could run um, in something that we knew how to support. So we had Anaconda and people just ran that. Um, but then, of course, people wanted to be able to add their own packages, add their own libraries, and supporting that across a very large number of users starts to get a little tricky. So we gave people these recipes for how to basically customize their kernels to be able to do what they wanted. So, so we kind of used the kernel spec and then showed people how to, here's what you want to add to your library path, here's, you know, you, you still want to use the same, um, Conda package, but then you want to add other packages to your kernel spec, and then you can run with your own packages. Um, so before I go further, I want to thank Min for a lot of help with throughout all of this. So I think couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're up for the more dangerous part of this talk. Um, Roland's going to do a couple of live demos and kind of show us how we've used this.
start with the live demos with Shreyas's idea. Just to, before I get started, I just wanted to see, like, are there people here who've actually used, like, supercomputers at, like, a HPC computing system, like a Cray system? So you're familiar with batch queue systems like PBS, Torque Moab, or Slurm? Slurm? Okay. Cool. Slurm's cool, man. Um, as, okay, it's a batch system. It's not cool. Um, so live demos, if, if this goes bad, then um, we'll just have to figure out how to fill up the time. Where's the... Ah, uh, got it. Thanks. This way. All right. Um, so I'm going to show you a couple notebooks. Um, Uh, the first one's going to be uh, from an actual experiment that uses, uh, basically runs their calibration procedure through Jupyter Notebooks. This is uh, Lux, the liquid underground xenon detector. They're looking for direct interaction of dark matter particles with stuff on Earth. And the way they do this experiment is they have a, like the biggest tank of liquid xenon on the planet. It's 400 kilograms of liquid xenon, and the dark matter particles go through and they interact with the xenon that's in there and they emit a little bit of light. And then an electric field pulls electrons that are liberated up to the top of the detector. And the drift time tells you the Z coordinate. And then through some modeling with these photomultiplier tubes, you can figure out where the original pulse came from. So you get X, Y, and Z. And the way that they, they calibrate this detector is that they put a radioactive source into it, like Krypton, and then they just wait for those decays to happen and then they, they measure the pulse widths and they correct the widths of these pulses basically um, to, uh, 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 to calibrate the, de the detector. It's a flat fielding exercise. So um, this is a real notebook that they, that they gave us. I think it's, it's pretty old now, so there might be some annoying old warnings, but we're actually interacting with um, data that's living on the NERSC global file system um, at NERSC. And so, of course, the entire experiment, if you've ever worked on an experiment like this, and you know, you, you do an analysis and you tell your advisor, here's what I did, and of course, like, they figure out that you did something wrong, and here you can actually show them everything that you've done wrong, and they can say, no, you should really pick a different threshold or something like that. So uh, everybody in the experiment basically can see. So this is kind of what the pulse rates look like, or pulse widths look like. We expect radioactive decay to look a particular way. <laughs> That's what this plot is here. Some filtering. Please stop watching movies if that's what you're doing out there. Uh, this is the correction factor, basically the flat fielding thing. And if, if you do this right, what it should look like um, at the end of the day is a completely flat. Why can't I scroll? There we go. Okay, so it's all been corrected for the pulse widths. And the second example is kind of um, going to show off basically that we are running this notebook actually on a login node on the supercomputer. So got 32 Haswell CPUs and about 500 gigabytes of, virtual, of memory, of total memory there. You can see the Scratch file system. Uh, you can see I probably need to clean some stuff up there before they purge me. Um, one of the things that um, you couldn't get from the original implementation, which was running in a Docker container, is it's not the exact same uh, Python environment. And so this leads to all kinds of problems when users um, want to, you know, migrate their workflow from Cori to the Jupyter Notebook or back and forth. And so actually having just a single environment that they can use on, on, on the system, that's a big plus. So um, batch queues are fun to submit your jobs to and then wait uh, maybe a, a couple of days to see when your job is going to run. So here's some examples of Slurm magic. So you can see all the jobs that are kind of waiting in the queue or running or configuring nodes to run. And oh, it actually picks up my particular way of liking to format the output of the SQ command, which shows me all of these jobs. 
Um, the output is actually in a pandas data frame. Um, so if you're waiting for your job to run and you want to do, oh, I did something wrong, and you want to do some data science on everybody else's job, like figure out how long it's going to take for your job to run, uh, you can do that. You can actually submit jobs from cells. It's a simple job that just prints out host name. And I'd be surprised if I actually get to um, get this job actually done or not. It's probably not going to run in the amount of time that I'm going to have here. So I can't show you the output, but it, it's going to print out a host name for, um, for a compute node, basically. All right, so you can submit jobs. This is on a specialized login node that was set aside for running Jupyter when we bought the machine, All right? So what are we going to do in the future? So um, Treyas mentioned the first incarnation had about 100 users, and that rapidly, you know, they were rapidly stepping on each other, and so we needed to expand the service. We added the Cori login node version of our Jupyter Hub installation, and the next step is going to be getting users actually running Jupyter notebooks on the compute nodes on the Cray system. And so how are we going to do this? Um, this is another picture of our system. There's 10,000 nodes in, in all those cabinets. And I should mention we're number six on the top 500 right now. Um, the way that this is going to work is that we're going to enable access um, to the system through a few specialized queues and interactive queue, which is going to, um, in, is, which is enabled by a, a rack of, of nodes that's just set aside for interactive workflow. So you can submit a job and you get a, basically within a couple of minutes you get um, you get a node or up to 20 nodes for four hours. Um, so you can actually do interactive exploration of data on a compute node or on a small mini cluster running inside of, of the system. So that becomes feasible. So the, the, the green box at the top is, is what we've got now. It's, it's one of these you know, login nodes, which is kind of on the outside of the network of the system, um, but it's still attached to the system. The gold boxes are a couple of representative uh, kind of configurations for what we are working on right now. And so this would be like just migrating your, your, your workflow from the Cori login node out to a single Cori compute node where you're running a notebook and some kernel processes, or a single Cori compute node running a notebook server and a whole bunch of other Cori compute nodes, maybe 100 nodes or something like that that are running a bunch of kernel processes. So we're thinking about, till the end, we're, we're thinking about these kinds of um, uh, configurations, running desk jobs or Spark um, powered by Jupyter. Um, we've done both of those. Um, haven't had users really, really take off with them yet, um, but we know they're coming. Oh, there's a whole bunch of arrows on this. <laughs> That's why I don't have a demo, is because all the arrows make a, a demo really far too risky. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to leverage um, software-defined networking so that once the user is authenticated through our GSI authenticator or whatever authenticator we actually end up using, the head node of the job allocation will advertise an IP, an external IP address back to the user, and they'll just be able to connect directly. And that's a pretty new capability for us uh, on these Cray systems. Um, Another modality, I guess, is basically you could have a long-running um, uh, notebook process running on that service node, on that log Jupyter node, and then submit jobs and then connect to your jobs, your kernels, or your cluster that are, is running out on the, on the compute nodes and manage workflows through, uh, through a notebook interface. And so we actually have a, a project. There's a LDRD uh, project led by Shreyas and Matt Henderson. Matt had a, a very nice poster yesterday about this project, Kali. Um, so, Oliver, who's and, and Oliver, who's, who's over in the corner, okay. And so this is about real-time monitoring of HPC jobs and output widgets, dashboards for job output management. It's a lot nicer maybe than SQ, but really putting together workflows, a lot of these experimental data analysis workflows are things that have a lot of parallelism and then like almost no parallelism and then lots of parallelism and then some human in the loop kind of stuff. And so putting that together uh, in a, through Jupiter is what this project is about. So our hope is that within uh, the next couple of months, we'll, we'll have the ultimate configuration of Jupiter at NERSC running. Um, like I mentioned, software-defined networking is going to have a, a very big role here, advertising notebook server IP addresses back to users. 
different ways of running notebooks and kernels, different kind of combinations, your whole job, your whole workflow being in the compute nodes or maybe split across compute nodes and login nodes, um, leveraging interactive um, queues. Um, one of the things that Shreyas mentioned is that we have a containerized or um, we have containers in HPC now um, based on Docker, a, a, a system that we developed called Shifter. Um, we're going to be exposing the ability to run um, Docker containers with your entire Python environment if you want um, in those and you'll just spin, uh, throw those out to the compute nodes and be able to connect up to those. Um, and really actually on a Cray system, um, just because of the way the file system is configured, this is really the only way that we're gonna be able to, to scale up um, large scale, uh, especially Python applications. Um, there are a number of other possibilities that we're looking into running the notebook or schedulers like desk schedulers on one partition of the system and having jobs that span both the, the data friendly partition and then the many core partition, this, this night's landing partition. Um, in addition to the customizations uh, to the spawner and the authenticator classes that Shreyas mentioned, we're adding additional um, stuff that kind of customizes um, Jupyter to the NERSC in ecosystem. And this is all based off of wrap spawner and batch spawner. But basically we'll be able to expose resources like do you want the burst buffer that, that layer of fast NVRAM um, included in your job? Do you want to run your job on a query node, a compute node, on an edge service node, maybe on a different supercomputer in the system or at the, at the center? And also we want to customize the user experience so that you, know, you don't have to remember all of your um, say allocation repos and type in each one of them. It should know what, uh, what repos you can actually charge to, or maybe allow users to sort of set up job templates of their own and select which one they're gonna run. So um, none of this would have been possible without a lot of help from other people. Um, MSI, TAC, and SDSC have, have given us a lot of the pieces or shown us the way to how, to how to customize different aspects of the Jupyter ecosystem so that we can you know, we can adapt it to, to our environment. And of course, the Jupyter dev team has been exceedingly helpful in answering questions. So this slide is just about letting you know that you know, we're, we're providing Jupyter to users maybe in a different context from a lot of the other kinds of things that we see at this conference. So this is you know, big science. Um, and Jupyter is ex ex becoming extremely popular there. We don't have 100,000 users at NERSC, but we have 7,000 users and almost every one of them uses Python in some way and a substantial fraction of them are expecting to be able to, to use Jupyter. Um, we're working on ways to figure out how to scale up jobs using Jupyter to handle the large data sets, multi hundred terabyte, petabyte data sets that, that are gonna be resident at, at NERSC in the next few years. And then, um, especially for the JupyterCon audience, we thought we'd outline a couple high level takeaways, which is most of what we've done has really just been customizing or extending existing interfaces in the NERSC uh, ecosystem, for the NERSC ecosystem. And so we really appreciate the thought and hard work that went into designing these interfaces and figuring out what the right abstractions are because you know, when we don't have to hack somebody else's code, just implement what we need, it's, it's really a lot nicer and a lot easier for us to maintain and explain to our security people and our management what we're doing actually. Um, external to that, we have had to add some, I would just say hacks, I guess, uh, to make things work, helper scripts on the, on, the, on the compute system. We also have to kind of negotiate or work with the networking team to change configuration so that we can actually connect different parts of the supercomputer that initially weren't you know, designed to talk to each other maybe out of the box, right? And then um, we actually are leveraging an API for a supercomputing center called Newt, uh, which is designed and written by Shreyas here. So that's, that's going to be essential, I think. And of course, what do our users say? This is like the top comment um, that they don't ever want to SSH in anymore. And in fact, we envision that there's going to be a very large class of users in the future who probably never SSH into a command line on Cori or any of our systems and just interact through Jupyter. Okay. So that's it.
Thanks. Yeah. We have 10, ten minutes. minutes for questions. Um, Shreyas and Roland, if you can repeat the questions for the audio, I think that'll help. Sure. The Lux data set. Oh, it isn't. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll have to. I don't, so I don't think that this is um, a really huge data set. I think we're talking about much less than a, maybe a few hundred gigabytes worth of data, basically. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah, so the question was about the, the root kernel that, um, that Shreya sh uh, showed. Um, yeah, we can, we can talk about that. And actually, if, if you have questions about what we did to set it up, to, to set that up, it was, it was pretty easy. It was really not much more than defining that, that one kernel spec file after we had rebuilt. Okay. All right. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How do we submit Spark jobs? Um, with what? Yeah. So. Um, what I'll say about um, Spark and analytic software on a Cray system is that um, you know, the supercomputing vendors realize that there is a need for um, tools like this on their systems. And so they're, you know, but working out with them exactly how you do this in their environment, is, it's kind of a partnership. And so that means that we develop a lot of uh, tools ourselves um, that because maybe off the commercial off the shelf solutions, like maybe what you're talking about, um, are just not built for, uh, are not engineered with the Cray system in mind. And so yeah. we do have to do quite a bit of customization. We actually use, I think we leverage Docker uh, quite a bit actually to, to, to manage large scale Spark jobs. Um, yeah, but in terms but, of the yeah. actual submission, we basically would just it's have a job. the head node that, that sort of shares um, the, the, the same node as, as the Jupyter login node, and then you can communicate with that. But Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, it, yeah, yeah, it would have to basically right. be able to talk to the Spark head node directly. So, yeah. So, right now we submit it all as one job. Um, and usually, Spark jobs are just submitted as regular jobs and they're not attached to Jupyter quite yet. To make that work, we have to do something like be able to, you know, finish the, the software defined networking piece so that we can actually run that in the same cluster, basically, as the Spark cluster that's running. Or we have to, um, kind of reverse the way that the network is working so that we can expose the login node uh, onto the same network as all of the compute nodes and interact that way. And so both, both we have plans to, to, to set up both of those kinds of, of uh, workflows. No, so the, the Jupyter Hub server is actually just on a separate node entirely because the, the, the Hub server, the, the, un, under the new sort of, in, or, or the, the uh, yeah, so the Hub server is basically a separate service um, and it sp uses the SSH spawner to go off and spawn notebooks on this big giant login node with, with um, and, and what we're moving towards is this idea of being able to use that to spawn notebooks not just on the login nodes but also on the compute nodes.
so yeah, so the, the, the question was about the environment, right? Having two environments, one in the Docker container, which was separate from the, the actual Python environment that's running on Cori. Um, and the, the second iteration of our architecture solved that problem by just having the hub piece be in the Docker container and then spawn the notebook, uh, the notebook server actually on the, com on, the, on the compute system. And so then you know, they just pick up whatever Anaconda Python we, we're running on, on Cori that's, you know, that's backing that. And so that's the same exact Python they would get from a module load when they log in by SSH. So the idea is you just de decouple the hub from the uh, act, the rest of the service. So what kind of visualization are you seeing now on that like first deployment? Like, this happens with really popular service. Yeah. That's why we have to. That's why we have to get this software-defined networking business going because there's about a hundred users, um, hundred unique users. Just today, there are fifty notebook servers running today on that one login node. And, and if you've ever used the system like this, you know that you know, the system administrator will come along and bash you if you, uh, if you do computing stuff on the login node, right? But we've got it, this is a special login node where we let them do that kind of stuff. But even today, they're stomping on each other. Yeah, I mean, it's and a big node. It's got like, what, 768 gigs of RAM and lots of CPUs, but at some point you run up against yeah. those limits. So. Generally, they're not all computing all at the same time. Um, we don't have resource limits in place yet. Uh, but I think we're getting there, and I think that uh, imposition of resource limits is going to be something that's going to drive the users to say, "Look, give me another option." And so that's why the you know running Jupyter jobs on the compute nodes is is something we really need to get going here in the next couple of months. I think. Yeah, I mean, so we we're gonna that that's where you have to put U limits and and make sure that people. Don't it's, have. it's kind of the same problem as any other login node that you have with, with users, right? Yeah. So the question was, what, what can users essentially take down the service? Yeah. I think with last question, yeah. Uh, so when you go to the software-defined networking, uh, do you, will you still use the like, Jupyter as a proxy for Jupyter Hub, or is that specifically out of the way? Um, yeah, I, so I, I don't think it impacts the Hub part of it, because you still want people to come in through that one common interface. Um, so really what it'll do is it'll allow us to create a virtual tunnel between the hub and the backend nodes. Because right now you can't go both ways. Um, you can only pull from a login node. So yeah, the question was whether software-defined networking um, will allow us to remove the hub as a proxy. And maybe we can look into that. But our plans right now are to still have people funnel through the hub because it gives us a single point of control there. Is that right? I mean. I think that's about right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, thank you.